myself, I'm Ian O'Donnell, as well as my role as Chair of the Federation of Small Businesses. I'm also a web design business based in Hampton and Arden. Um, and we help companies, small and large, with social media strategy and online marketing strategies. So that's my bit of uh, uh, talk this morning. Something to do And Sandra, Hello, my name is Sandra Garvick, and I'm the founder and owner of DeMarco Solicitors. Uh, we're employment and business law specialists, and one of my particular special specialisms is the uh, law surrounding social media and in particular the misuse of social media. So I'll be talking a little bit about that. So I'm the upside, that's the downside. <laughs> <laughs> that's not in terms of the quality of speaking, but it is quite that. Right, so social media, what, what happens online? Um, this is just one of those diagrams that I love, just in terms of the sheer volume of data that's being generated, the sheer volume of communication that's happening. You know, the, the question we have to ask as we're going through this presentation is how do you make your style stand out? How do you make sure your voice is heard to the people that you want to hear it? Where, as you can see, in, 30, in one internet minute, you've got 30 hours of video being uploaded. In 2015, it would take you five years to watch all the video crossing the internet in one, in one second. So that's the sort of volumes of data that we're talking about. Facebook is getting 6 million people looking at it in one minute. <coughs> so, there's enormous opportunity, but there's enormous competition as well out there for content. And so, it all seems very new, amazing technology, but actually, the basics of what I'm going to talk about is nothing new. Social media might seem a bit like the Emperor's New Clothes at times. It's a wonderful new thing. It's going to solve every problem in your business. It's going to be the wonderful route to market, and by the way, it's all free, supposedly. Um, so people get sucked into this, it's going to be the panacea for all else. But actually, social media is nothing new. What we've all come here to do today in terms of networking is basically what we're talking about when it comes to social media. It's an opportunity to network in a virtual forum. And actually, from my experience, social media works its best when it's combined with your other marketing strategies. Don't try and do it in isolation. Um, just to get a bit of a, an idea, who here is on some of the social media platforms? Who here is on Twitter? Okay, we're fairly good. The, the, the numbers each year when I do these sort of talks are definitely going up. The, the people involved in their social media Facebook, yeah, LinkedIn, hoping for 100% coverage on LinkedIn, we're almost there. Um, Google Plus, yeah, the numbers drop significantly. Though those of you who've got your hands down may be surprised. You might actually find you have got a Google Plus profile and you just didn't know about it. Google will have a nasty habit of doing that. Um, Pinterest. Oh, we, we're dropping the numbers down now, but we're down to the ones and twos. Instagram. Okay, three, four, five or so. <coughs> Foursquare. Yeah, I have one or two Foursquare, fellow Foursquare users. That's the really geeky one for people who like getting points as they visit places. Basically, by saying you use Foursquare, you're basically admitting to be a geek. I quite like this little thing about sort of summarising the various social media networks and what they represent. I particularly like the one about Google Plus. The only people using it are people from Google. Um, another interesting one is, you know, what do you share and where? That's often one of the questions, you know, what, what content do I share and where do I share it? And um, for the start off, do you actually want anybody to see it? If you don't, then share it on Google Plus. Um, <laughs> if you're in a bar, then obviously Foursquare is what you need to be doing. And then we get on to, would it be awkward to explain to your boss? Yes, then don't post it. And the source manager will cover some more about that in a moment. If it's boring, then post it on LinkedIn. Um, <laughs> if, if, if it's going to attract likes, then post it on Facebook. Um, and otherwise, then Twitter is your source of um, activity. And I'm, as some of you will know, I'm a big Twitter user. One of the questions I guess asked is, well, how do I interact with these various social media networks? There, you know, what is the etiquette about it all? And it's, I try to explain it like this. In the real world, there are different etiquettes depending upon the locations. You know? So what is appropriate <coughs> behaviour when you're in a shopping centre from a shopping assistant is inappropriate behaviour in a pub. So let me give you an example. If you were in a shop looking at some clothes, one would hope that a shopping assistant would come over and say, can I help you, sir or madam? Is there anything you'd like to know? Can I get nothing different size for you? You expect to be approached and to be networked with, to be talked to about what you're looking to do. 
that's appropriate in a shopping environment. But if you're in a pub and somebody comes up to you and says, I've got a bag full of CDs, would you be interested in purchasing one or two? A, you say, go away, I'm having a nice social time with your mates, and B, you probably question where those CDs might be uh, acquired from, shall we say. So different places we're used to in the real world, quite a phrase, we expect different behaviours in, don't we? And the same applies on social media. So on LinkedIn, as a business-to-business -business networking website, then talking about business and actively going out there and promoting yourself a bit and what you do as a business and being proactive in your use of LinkedIn to try and attract customers is far more appropriate behaviour there than, for example, on Facebook, which is far more a social, down-at-the-pub type environment, if you like. So if you're looking at how you're going to market to people on the different social media networks, then it's important the tone of voice and the way you communicate with them and what you're communicating about is appropriate to that social network. Challenges of social media. And this is for big and small organisations. One at the top left, time management. Everybody will say, well, how on earth do I find the time to do it? And I could say, well, of course, the great idea is you come and pay real point to manage your social media for you. But actually, um, there are really good ways and means you can use to improve your time management on it. For example, scheduling um, your tweets to make sure you have at least a regular flow of tweets going out without having to make sure you remember every two or three hours to put another tweet up on your phone. One of the other big ones is internal buy-in. Especially in larger companies, this is often reflected by the fact that the board of exec um, executives, um, the board, <laughs> executive board are made up of 40 plus year old men who are largely the lowest um, users of social media, so they don't get it. And then the marketing person says, we need to do this, and they say, mm, don't really get it, don't work it out, go and do it over there and don't do it anything to do with the rest of our marketing activity. Which comes on to the one just to the right of that about integrated approach. Many companies get social media wrong because they put social media over there and the rest of their marketing activity over here. It's important if you're going to look at social media that you integrate it as part of your overall marketing strategy. Mix it in with your email marketing, mix it in with your offline marketing, think about how they're all going to connect together and work for you. Think about your networking and how you're using social media to back up your networking at breakfast this morning or whatever else it might be. Make sure you're making the opportunities to connect on LinkedIn, to follow them on Twitter. Um, as relationships develop, some of them might be appropriate to connect with on Facebook as well. I have many friends who are business friends, friends, business, it's quite blurred as a small business owner, isn't it? So make sure that you're getting it all connected, otherwise it won't work. It's as simple as that. Um, that's one of my big bugbears for many social media gurus who seem to think that it all works in isolation, as I say, being passive or else. The other one I'll pick up on there is generating quality, relevant content. One of the big challenges people say is, what do I tweet? What do I share? And I'll explain in a bit about some of the way I approach our social media strategy. And the final one is internal experience. Um, so often, especially in slightly larger organisations, they get an intern in, or a, somebody who's just left university, or even worse, somebody who's just left school. Obviously, they're young, they know all about social media, and they hand them the keys to the kingdom. They say, here you go, access to all our social media accounts, can you be responsible for our social media? Now, this person has no idea of business, hasn't heard one of Sandra's excellent talks telling you about the pitfalls of social media, and proceeds to create an absolute firestorm normally for the business by tweeting something or Facebook something completely inappropriate. I did have one client who, while sitting in a meeting, um, one of their members of staff tweeted about how boring the meeting was, was and actually mentioned the client's name and by hashtag in the tweet. And surprisingly, um, she didn't last very long. Um, one of the questions are, where are our customers? One of the other big mistakes people make is they try and do everything or go for the wrong social media channels. So, as with all marketing, as I say, there's nothing new under the sun. As with all marketing, the first thing to do is try and work out who your customers are, build a bit of a profile of them, work out what age they are, what sex they are, what their interests are, and then talk to somebody who knows or go and do a bit of research online and find out which social media network is the most appropriate to interact with them. Just to give you some idea of where companies are at the moment, Twitter's the, the big one where there's folks in time, LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, blogging's down at the bottom. I don't disagree with where people are focusing their times. But to give you some 
Other ideas, where people are sharing content, Facebook's getting 41%, 30%, Twitter, Pinterest 20%, and then you've got the other smaller ones. But to give you some examples of how that breaks down across the different social media channels, if you're in e-commerce, look at the difference it makes to how important Pinterest can be for your business. So if you're selling to consumers, especially in the, the retail, fashion, um, things that appeal largely, to be honest, to 25 to 40 year old female demographic, Pinterest is vital. If you haven't got that as part of your um, plans, then you need to rethink some of your planning. If you're in travel and hospitality, your local cab, then Facebook is massively more important than it was before. So you need to think about the right social media channels and the right way to be sharing with it for where you are, what you're involved in, and for where you are. The, the demographics for Europe are different from America, etc., etc. One of the other important things for social media is these days it's actually not directly about the traffic that you're going to get from social media itself, and the inquiries you're going to get from that, though it's great, I do get business from it, but the importance of search. There's a survey done each year by search metrics about the um, factors that have affected search engine positioning, so where you come up on search engine results. And they look at the top 50 factors, and the ones highlighted in orange are the social media factors. So in the top 10, we have seven um, social media factors that affect it. So social media will have a big impact on where you appear on search results. So sharing your content, sharing links to your website, sharing links to your blog will make a big difference to where you appear on the search engines. And finally, a slide which leads nicely into what Sandra's about to say, but uh, these are my basic rules about what you should and shouldn't share on social media. Um, never post anything you wouldn't want your parents, children, boss, clients, colleagues to see. If you're not sure, leave it until you are. Probably leave it then as well. And my be right, be positive. We've all been in meetings, face-to-face -face meetings, networking events, where we've got with that person who's negative. Everything they say is, oh, isn't it awful, isn't it bad, blah, blah, blah. And there's nothing more off-putting. You're desperately looking for the way to get away from that person as quickly as possible, I think. And the same is true on social media. If you're a moaner, and a minor, <coughs> then that's not the place to be doing that. Um, save it for when you are down the pub with your, your mates. Um, but on social media, especially if you're in business, look at how you can be positive, not negative. And at that point, I'll hand over to Thank you. Um, as I said at the outset, I'm going to talk about some of the sort of the risks um, of social media. Um, so, sorry. Um, so I'm going to talk about maximising opportunities and minimising the damage. Um, it takes years sometimes to build up your business and build up your brand and build up your profile on social media. It can take seconds to destroy it and I'll give you a few examples shortly. But remember, one of the key things I do say to my clients is remember that business communication, social media, whatever you put out there stays out there. Um, quite often if you put something out on Twitter, it's there forever. It's on the internet forever. Um, so do remember that it's a business communication, it's coming from your business, it's the same as any letter, email, leaflet. Check your spelling, check your pronunciation, um, although it, it is common to abbreviate slightly on Twitter, it's still much better, it comes across better if it's a business communication and it's well drafted. Quite often if I'm going to put out a series of tweets, I'll proofread them before they actually go out. I'll make sure that I've had a good look at my 140 characters, um, even if it's linking back to the website, and do check what I'm going to put out there before it goes out, because it's a reflection on you and your business. Quite a lot of people now are using social media platforms in recruitment, and as an employment solicitor, that's something that I would say is a good thing to do, but you need to be really wary of discrimination. Obviously with any recruitment process or if you're engaging people or if you're engaging in contracts with people, it's great to do a bit of research and it's a fantastic research tool now um, to do some preparatory work before you go to a meeting or before you interview anybody. If you're using it in a recruitment context, however, do make sure you make notes on why that candidate wasn't successful for the role and not just because you didn't like their appearance. Once I had um, I was doing some uh, recruitment for a trainee solicitor and I was just Googling the, the shortlisted candidates and uh, a Facebook photo came up and also a, an extract from an um, inappropriate <laughs> uh, YouTube video. 
which did involve nakedness. So uh, that candidate wasn't selected because that would have brought my company into disrepute. Um, I've put retention up there because obviously if you get employees um, that are phoning in sick and they've got long term illness or they've got back problems and you can see on social media that they're posting that they're dancing on tables then obviously you've got evidence there that you may wish to use against them if they weren't uh, being genuinely sick and that has been used. It is now accepted ex evidence in a tribunal or court if you've got a printout from a social media, Facebook page, Twitter account or whatever, it is successfully used if obviously the grounds uh, substantiated uh, for dismissing and it has been used successfully as evidence. Um, and as I say, for removal and fair dismissal claims and that, the evidence has been there and it has been used successfully. I've got their confidentiality. Um, quite often now people are th not thinking before they post. I always say don't tweet with wine. Um, it's a very wise tip. You can breach confidentiality, confidential issues about your clients, about your employees. Employees can breach confidentiality about their employers. Social media needs to be monitored. So if you can't, don't have the time to do it yourself and you're outsourcing, it does still need to be monitored for those breaches. Intellectual property, you know, you might be launching a fantastic new product. Um, somebody may be tweeting about something you're doing that's inappropriate. Def defamation now, the defamation laws have recently changed. Um, they're coming, it's coming into effect in April. To take into account the changes in um, technology and the way that things are moving up forward with social media. Um, if you make a defamatory remark, and you know, defamatory remark is something which is stated, which is untrue, which causes damage to somebody, social media, if you do it via a tweet or via a post, it is again used in evidence and it can be used successfully in court. Um, there's a lot of harassment around uh, on social media. We've probably read in the press about youngsters that are being harassed by social media platforms. This is now taken very, very seriously. I don't practice criminal law, but I know if you're ever suffering from harassment or from cyberbullying, it's an offence now and it is reportable to the police. And if you know of anybody or any young person that is suffering that, always report. The police will take this very, very seriously now. I've put this uh, picture up of um, a YouTube video and if you've heard me talk about social media before you would have heard this story but I'll just briefly mention it. Uh, this was posted by a friend of mine who's an accountant, he was an accountant for a local authority. Um, quite a, a lovely guy and he doesn't mind me sharing this story. He rides roller coasters all over the world, he's a roller coaster fanatic, he's done the only nude roller coaster coaster ride on Adolton Towers. Um, it is on YouTube somewhere, I believe. Um, but he posted this. He went to the Alpine Meters coaster, which is on a pole with no brakes, and he put a camera on his lap, and he's going down, and he's going uh, all the way down. It's quite steep and quite hairy. You actually get a feel for it. He posted it on YouTube, and within three days, he got six and a half million views. He was picked up by CNN News. He was picked up by the local news, BBC, everybody. Now, if he'd been working for your company or working with you, and that was something inappropriate, can you see how viral that could have become and how quickly? Fortunately for him, he gained a new job out of it and he got a lot of TV and media coverage, so it was a good story for him. But if that was something inappropriate, or an employee of your company, and that had gone viral over a weekend, could you imagine the impact on your business? So do be careful what you post. You're right. Okay, so when things do go wrong, um, there's been some really good Twitter campaigns that companies have used. Waitrose did one last year. I like shopping at Waitrose because hashtag Waitrose reasons. They got comments such as, I like shopping at Waitrose because you don't see people that you would expect to find in Aldi. Um, I like shopping at Waitrose because, and it just, it went viral. Everybody was posting all these derogatory comments about all the other supermarkets. Waitrose had to do some quick backtracking and within hours it had changed and they put a different statement on and, and everything like that. But you can see by not anticipating what the responses would be, how it could go against them. British Gas, on the day they launched that they were doing the massive price increases, put out a tweet. Tweet your questions using Ask British Gas, Ask BG. Everyone was berating them for, um, obviously, the price increase. They weren't posting questions. It was really, really bad PR. 
McDonald's had a hashtag called McD Stories, and everyone was posting about how bad the content of the burgers was and how poor quality they were. Again, they weren't thinking in advance of what the outcomes could be. There has been very little case law on social media to date, but there has now been quite a big LinkedIn case which came out recently. And this was to do with protecting your contacts. What do you do if you've got a lot of contacts or you've got a member of staff or an associate you're working with who have got a lot of contacts that are your clients on their LinkedIn profile? Everybody knows that a LinkedIn profile is a personal profile. But if you haven't got it written into contracts with your outsourcers, contracts with your employees, that that is a requirement that they remove those contacts when they leave your employment, then potentially they could walk off with your contacts. Now what these three guys did, they started up a company while still working for their employer. They started collecting business cards, 450 of them. They did this massive LinkedIn campaign and then they left and planned this massive party, this launch party. In fact, they might have still planned the party while they were still employed. And they invited all these people from these 450 business cards to move business and go with them. What the court said, they actually granted a springboard injunction, which is quite rare, and they prevented these three employees from using those 450 business contacts. What the case didn't go into detail about was whose contacts they were on LinkedIn. So I think this will go further, and I think eventually subsequent case law will come out and say actually whose contacts are they when you leave somebody's employment. But it was really important that they granted that injunction in that case. Sally Burko made the inappropriate tweet about Lord McAlpine. You all saw it in the press, out of court settlement. Um, but that, what was interesting is Lord McAlpine actually threatened anybody who'd retweeted that he was going to go after them too. I don't actually think he did, but there was that possibility. So be careful what you share on social media, be careful what you retweet, because obviously there could be implications for you. And I have mentioned previously cyberstalking cyber cyber, cyber and harassment. Got a picture of a mobile phone there. I mentioned it earlier in my talk. Did you know that there are more people who own iPhones and mobile phones than there are babies born? Um, being on a mobile and online social media has overtaken porn as the number one online activity. That's how prevalent it is now. So do be careful. Okay, so consider the risk versus reward. Insurance policies. If you post something inappropriate within your business and you are subsequently uh, faced with court action, will you be covered on your insurance? I don't know whether insurance policies have updated, but there may be exclusions. Check your compliance. Check whether things you are posting, check whether it breaches any compliance in your industry. I know that um, if you're FCA regulated, there's certain things that you have to say when you advertise, so check that there are any compliance restrictions. Identity theft. Um, never post your year of birth because that is now being used heavily in identity theft. So if you are putting your birthdays on social media platforms, try and leave the year out. And then don't tell everybody it's your 40th birthday. Um, and finally, and as I've mentioned before, whose contacts are they? So make sure you've got the documentation, the contracts in place, which clearly identify who those contacts be belong to. Thank you. Um, so after all of that, um, if you're not too scared, so the question left is, well, are you actually going to bother with social media within your business? Um, so here's some of the things that I would say, the way to approach it. Don't do it just with a me too attitude. When everybody else is doing it, so I've got to. I would agree. It's got to the point where if it isn't part of your part of the mix, then you, you have got to start seriously considering it. But don't do it just because everybody else is, because they might be doing it, but they might be doing it in the right way. I've mentioned already about knowing your audience, find out where they are. Importantly, have goals. Social media can very easily be a time suck. And because people are unsure of it and they're sold, that says the Emperor's New Clothes by some social media guru, there's no real tangible KPIs that you're, what you're doing is being measured on. So, importantly, when you're looking at your social media activity, just like any other aspect of your business, and especially with marketing, make sure you've got some goals. Once you've got some goals, you can develop a strategy to succeed in those goals, and then you can measure whether it is worth investing your time or not. This is a diagram of how I approach social media, the sort of hub and spoke 
approach. So one of the big things I'm a fan of is blogging. Um, does anybody here blog? <coughs> we have one or two bloggers in the audience. Blogging, um, at least a couple of times a month, can be a great source of content. It's really great for search engines. It can really help with the search engine performance. But importantly, a blog can generate tweets for the next three or four months. It can generate you know, a tweet a day for the next few weeks. Um, so that means something you can then share on all of the social media channels. What then happens is you've got your hub, and then you can use the various social media channels to both use that content to share and to drive traffic back to your blog. All of that then is being seen by the search engines as positive activity for your website so that you're helping your website move up the search engine rankings as well. Alongside all of that, your blog can also form content through your email marketing. So we recommend to clients who are perhaps doing a quarterly newsletter that you can use your best blogs for the last few months to form the basis of the content for your newsletter. So you've got a content generating machine. And we recommend to clients that they generate a 12 month plan for their blogging activity. Because there's nothing worse than sitting down saying, I've got to write a blog this morning. I have absolutely no idea what I'm going to write it on. So get a few people together and come up with a 12 month plan of titles and it makes the whole job a lot easier. I mentioned it's really important for search engine optimization. And you'll notice, despite all my derogatory comments about Google Plus earlier, uh, yeah, the Google Plus does feature, there's a big reason for that. Google owns Google Plus. Guess what else Google do? They run Google Search Engine, which still has over 90% of the search traffic going through it. And guess what? Google Plus is one of the big drivers on how they choose to rank their content on Google search engine results. So having a strategy for Google Plus, despite it not perhaps being the best social media engine for actually generating direct traffic, it's vital to help with the search engine results. And increasingly, Google embedded Google Plus into all of their social media. So YouTube, um, your Gmail account, obviously, and various things like that are all using your Google Plus account as the, the hub of that, if you like. Obviously, all of this then feeds across to your website, so you've got your blog linking to your website, you'll also be sharing content from your various social media channels across your website, and again, that will all help drive search engine traffic to your website. So when we're looking at the client's social media strategy, that's how we're looking at the various things they're involved in. What to share? Anything and everything. Um, somebody actually said to me earlier, I almost invariably get this question when I'm talking about social media. Well, nobody wants to know about the fact that I went running at the weekend. Well, nobody wants to know about the fact that I had a coffee at the new cafe in town. When you go networking, what do you invariably end up talking? You don't talk non-stop business sales, do you? you? You build the whole picture of the person you're talking to when you go networking. We talk about what you might have been up to at the weekend. You talk about those sort of things. So in many ways, social media, especially the personal use of social media, but within a business context, so my personal Twitter feed, which I use for business, then talking about some of the personal activity, obviously not all personal activity, that you get up to, is worthwhile doing. And I've actually picked up clients who, because I'm a runner, because I'm a cyclist, they share a common thread with me, and so therefore want to do business with me. So it is important in that sense. Well, share news, topical, um, testimonials, projects that you've just completed. Um, share about good news for your clients. Share about good news for your suppliers, because they'll feel part of it, and they'll normally retweet your content then as well, so it can help spread the word. So the whole other things. If you want um, some more ideas and some more tips on that, if you drop me uh, an email, then I can uh, <laughs> drop my list of content suggestions. Important with social media, yes, it's global. Yes, the idea is that I can post a tweet on Twitter and somebody in the depths of China, somebody well, probably not there, it's probably blocked, but somebody in America, somebody in Russia can go and read that tweet. But actually, social media works best when it works locally, following local people, people you know from face to face networking, and that sort of thing works really well. So that's just some of the places you can go to find out about local people involved in Twitter. And one of the big things that um, I've been involved in recently and has been really helpful for my business is the um, hash hours. So hashtags, which is something you put as part of your tweet, and therefore you can follow everybody who's putting the same hashtag into their tweet. So for example, between 7 and 8 p.m. this evening, I'll be taking part in the solid whole hour, which means I'll tag every one of my tweets that I send during that time with hash solid whole hour, and it's basically about 30 or 40, up to 100 of us sometimes, networking, but all just on Twitter. We're all sitting in our lounge, wherever it might be, actually doing it. But we're networking, sharing business ideas, having a chat, whatever it might be. 
um, virtually using hash hours. And those have been a really great driver of local business contacts, new people that I've met, and then actually we have what are called tweet ups, where you then go and meet face to face every few months or whatever. Um, and it's a really good way of mixing with a different group of people altogether that I would have met through conventional networking. Because often these people who didn't want to go to conventional networking because they were boring, but because they've got Twitter in front of it, it's something that's it's interesting. LinkedIn. Just a few tips to your LinkedIn profile. The biggest one, please, the top left, professional photo. The amount of LinkedIn profiles I still see with a, a half cut out photo from somebody's holiday stamps as the photo for their business profile. Make sure it's a professional photo, dress as people who expect to see you in a professional environment. And I always try, try to take a photo which has got my logo in the background, so if that photo gets shared and seen elsewhere, they can see which company I'm with as well. Informative headline. The first thing people are going to see other than your name is the headline that appears underneath it. So rather than just saying managing director, describe <coughs> what you do rather than what your business is. And some other things, just generally in terms of content, use other when posting links as a category, so you can actually write a description of the link. And think about the whole thing as a, if you're in business to business, if you're in sales for your business, think of it as a brochure, not a CV. It's not about listing your job capability, <coughs> it's about listing what your business is. That was a whistle stop tour of some social media ideas, some things to avoid, some suggestions. Um, I could talk for hours, as some of you will know that I can on this sort of topic. Um, but if you do want to know more, want a bit of more guidance, drop me an email, and um, I've got to have a chat with Becky sitting just there to book a room at her fantastic training venue to get and do some social media training in more depth if you're looking to actually how to do some of these on the various social media channels. Anything more to add at this point? I'm not sure you open up questions. Questions, anybody? Yes, what about? Yes, what about? Depends exactly what it's using from your personal Google Plus account. I mean, it, it, the big challenge at the moment with Google Plus is it, it's a mess, to be honest, in terms of what account is linked to what and what you can log in with what and what you've got connected with what. And they they're keep changing moving goalposts quite a bit. Um, but if it, if it's a personal, just at Gmail type yes. personal account. Um, one way of getting around that problem, to be honest, is to look at setting up a new personal account telling everybody what to do to use that one and then to, re to sort of reset that to the one you've got as a business to be using it for your business purposes. So that's one quick way around it to try and avoid a possible crossover. But go and have a chat with me afterwards and talk more about exactly what data it's sharing with Google Plus so I'll be able to help you in a bit more detail. Yes? Well, the first thing I would do, and part of the reason I'm a big fan of blog as the hub, is because it's the only aspect of social media which you own. First, if so, first and foremost, I would set up a blog on your own website because it's the only time that you will actually own content. At the end of the day, all the others could pull, plug could be pulled tomorrow, and all that you've done will go <coughs> because you don't own, in any way, shape, or form, really, the content on those various social media networks. Which is a big thing when it comes to LinkedIn. What we mentioned earlier about contacts that people don't realise you can actually back up your contacts on LinkedIn and download them as a spreadsheet. Worth doing, because the same LinkedIn could go bankrupt. It is a possibility. Um, but then in terms of once you've got your blog, there are other places that that content can be shared to. Um, so there are other content sharing websites. You might do guest blogs on other people's blogs. Um, media, news stories, sharing websites. Do be careful, though, about what's known as duplication of content. If Google sees the same content appearing everywhere and it doesn't know where the master place was of that content, it can actually seem just trying to scam their search engine and possibly give you a downturn in results. So it's important to make sure you've got that brought through. But certainly try and look at guest blogging opportunities because they're a great way of um, building up additional traffic for your own blog and obviously sharing the content through the various social media channels, um, on your own website, um, using email, various things like that. Um, we picked up um, media opportunities as well. From, so one of the great things about social media is journalists are really plugged into it. So it would be a great way of getting news stories picked up by journalists as well. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. What's sort of the other ways to kind of boost your kind of search engine optimization? Like what's sort of the quickest way of like kind of obviously like from the social media aspect? What's um, obviously other than the, the basics of search engine optimization, again, this could be a two hour talk on its own, just on the basics. But the basics are on site and off site. So you've got two areas. On site, what can you on your website? So that can you make sure you've got good title tags, good content, thinking about what people are going to be searching for and make sure you're talking about it on the website. All of the fast track, slightly dodgy ways <coughs> to the top of Google have largely been knocked on the head by their updates over the last 12, 18 months. They have really worked hard on things like link farms or the rest of it to try to build. Because um, one of the big things that Google looked at was inbound links to rank your website. But the dodgy ways of acquiring those have largely been knocked on the head. Um, so the other aspect is off-site SEO. That's partly where um, social media comes in, so social media links to your website. But also looking at other websites who you think it would be valuable for, you, for them to share your content and link to your website. Then have a conversation with them and see whether they would be happy to do so. Um, other off-site activity can be um, looking at news websites, trying to get guest blogs, get news stories up on them with links back to your website. So linking back to your website is the off-site, but be very careful these days. Don't trust the quick link building organisations that did exist. Um, you might get a quick result, but you might find a month later that Google spotted what you were doing and now you don't appear at all. Um, there's a few organisations, big organisations, that need it by that happening. <coughs> Any other questions? Yes? Ian, um, how many tweets would you recommend sending a day? Ooh, um, <laughs> a baseline I recommend is four or five tweets a day. Um, that partly depends on the audience you're targeting, um, how big a following you're looking to build up, and those sort of things. It part, and also, when you tweet is important, so find out when your or the people who follow you are more engaged to make sure you're tweeting at those times. Um, but it really just, that's a baseline, so it's certainly no less than four or five tweets a day. Um, but if you're in a, uh, certainly get a bit of a bigger following, lots of followers, you're targeting an audience who's social media savvy, then that can go to 20, 30, 40 tweets a day. So it really depends where you sit. Yes. Would that be original tweets or retweets? That could be a mixture of all of that. So that could be original tweets. I would, I would roughly say it needs to be, you certainly don't want to be more than 50% of retweet. So my Twitter, it'll be, it'll be probably 20 to 30% of Twitter activity is sharing of my content um, that I've developed. 20 to 30% would be thoughts, tips, just observations from that day. And the remainder will be retweeting, tweeting somebody else's content that I've spotted that I think is useful, that sort of thing as well. So that's sort of the rough, sort of 30, 30, 30 mix, which I know is quite a different one, but you know. Yes? Um, what are the best tools to use to make sure you these social media statistics? Partly it depends on what you're looking to measure. So in other words, going back to find out what goals you're looking to measure. But, um, the basics, Google Analytics, so make sure you know what traffic social media is driving to your website. So get Google Analytics set up, so get some goals set up, look at the acquisition traffic, and you'll see what's coming from the various social media channels. And see how long they're staying on your website, because that's important for KPI to measure. Not that they come to your page and bank straight off again, but they then perhaps visit a bit of time on your website. I use an application called Hoopsuite to manage my social media, um, the tweets I'm sending out on a scheduled basis. And that gives me data of how many people have clicked on the links. Um, another thing to look at is how much you're being mentioned. So there are tools that you can use to track keywords. Again, Hootsuite is one of the ones that can do this. So you can keep a tally of how many people are mentioning a particular term, if that's your brand name. It tends to not be so relevant for, for micro and small businesses, but for bigger businesses, that's something that's, that is important. Um, but it, it partly boils down to what you're looking to measure and what you're going to measure your performance against to determine what tools you then use to measure that. There are loads of tools out there um, of varying quality and varying costs, as is very good case. The top ones for I, Sprout Social is another good, really one, good one for make, using for both doing the activity and also measuring results. Um, and then there are various just good statistics ones as well. Okay? 
Any other questions? Anybody got any questions on the downside or risks that you want to avoid? We're all done. Fantastic. Thank you very much for listening and do come and speak to us afterwards if you want to know more.